Great to see you. Our God is good, amen? I don't know what sort of week you've had, what inward trials and temptations or outward persecutions or pressures you've had, but we come, we come around the Word of God and we trust God meets us here, He blesses us here and wherever you're at, whatever you're struggling with, whatever difficulties you're having, this is His means of growing us and drawing us near to His person and His presence, Amen? amen? So open up to Mark chapter 12. We believe that, so we read it and we preach it. That's us. We're, we're expositional here at Hope Church, meaning we go through books of the Bible. And it has been about a month since we were in Mark because we had uh, a short, short series uh, that we did in family worship. Um, uh, and also we, we had a, a couple of other standalones. But just before we're in uh, Mark 12, I need to remind you that there's... Um, uh, uh, Always seeking to help you uh, in, the, in the aim of family worship and, and family discipleship. Uh, 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 we have produced another resource. This, this one is, is a video form. So you've got the catechism, you've got the discipleship guide to go through your family with. But we've also produced a Q&A. So we, we gathered a bunch of questions that people had asked us. We, we, we wrote them all down and we did a uh, Q&A this last week. And the video is now available on our YouTube. It's going to be posted this afternoon. Um, uh, so that you can go and watch that and just see common, uh, commonly asked questions about family discipleship. I'm sure something in there will resonate with you and be of help. And the next video resource that will be coming out, hopefully by next Sunday, is, is just an example uh, uh, family worship set. So we're just going to film the mess and the chaos of you, of, of, of a family doing their family worship to just try and give a very handy uh, you know, here's how to do this, here's what might go wrong. So we want you all to succeed and where we're trying to put tools into your hands that, that it will be beneficial. So this week, we're doing that question number seven. You're teaching your children, learning, of course, as you go along and blessing one another around the word of God. I do have something else I want to say. Uh, 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 James had mentioned the baptism. Um, I just want to re- relieve any newcomer or new sa- newly saved person's anxieties uh, we pastors live for the salvation of souls from damnation. Uh, that is why I am on earth and have not been zipped up. That is why I do what I do. Vic does what he does. Keith does what he does. We love seeing God pluck sinners from death and give them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is never a bother for you to come up and say, hey, pastor, I don't know much of the Bible or I'm newly saved. I don't know how to live the Christian life. Can you help? That is absolutely what we love to do. You are never a bother, never wasting time. We're here for you. There's going to be other people who can help with that. We'll also point to other other ways to help, but please come. If you've been saved recently and you haven't been baptized It might not be that you get baptized on March 6th, but you might. So please come and talk to us. We want to talk to you, talk about what God's done in your life, see how we can get you integrated into this church body that loves newly saved people. Amen? Amen. 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 We're praying for that. So so come and talk to us so that we might see about you getting baptized and see how else we can bless you and help you in your Christian walk. Uh, So the next stage is that we will have a members meeting the week after on the the 13th. So if you've been here about six months, you're 18 and up, and you're a baptized Christian, and you think we teach what you want to hear, this is the place you want to covenant yourself to, commit to serve one another. If that's you, please come and talk to myself, Keith, or Vic. We'll have a sit down with you, walk through what membership looks like and how that goes about. We would love to do that with you. Okay, all clear? Love you very much. All right, in, in Mark chapter 12 now, I, I have to do some recap uh, because of how long it's been since we've been there. And I know we've got some new faces among us since we were last in Mark. Really, we've seen through the book of Mark the arrival and proclamation of the king of God's kingdom. So Jesus came and Mark's gospel was very explosive. He just started doing miracles, casting out demons, preaching provocative sermons. It was it was a house on fire. It was it was explosive and then he sort of took a took a few months where he just focused not on the big crowds but just on his disciples and taught them very key lessons that they're going to need to understand if they will be the human builders of the church, that is his apostles. He taught them. And then he came back into the public scene. And now what has been happening of late is what we've been calling the most significant seven-day period in all of human history. 
The most significant week that will ever occur is the week that we are now walking through by the pen of Mark's authorship. This is the week that Jesus rides into town on the donkey and everybody is is praising him and singing the very psalm that we opened our service with, Psalm 118. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. The, The Messiah is here. The King is coming. He's going to do all that God has promised. And he comes in like that. And then it's a fight. It is a it is a battle and it is argumentation about the scriptures between him and the priests, the Pharisees, the Levites. He's in the temple and remember he, he came in on the donkey one day. He goes back home. Next day he comes back in and he starts booting the tables over, flipping coin jars, whipping people out of the temple and when they had all scattered because they were selling goods at, they, they, they were making money in the temple that was supposed to be for prayer and worship. So he kicks them all out, and then he starts preaching about the corruption of the leadership that owned and taught in the temple. So he's picking a fight, and he's winning. But they try and take a fight back to him, and this is what we saw in our latest sermon, was they then came up to him and challenged him and said, whose authority are you doing this in? This is, this is a high claim that you're making. How dare you? And he said, I'll tell you how dare I if you tell me one question. Was John the Baptist a prophet of God or not? And awkward because they knew what would what would they knew what Jesus would say if they said, Yeah, he was. Jesus would say, Well, why didn't you listen to him, you hypocrites? And then if they said, No, he wasn't, he was demon possessed like you, then the crowds will crucify the Pharisees because they all went and got baptized by, by John. That, that's he's their boy. So, so they just sort of awkwardly uh, sit down and shut up like you're supposed to do when Jesus is preaching. And, and then what we have is, I know there's a chapter break, but there's no chronological break. Okay? They come up, interrupt his teaching while he's decrying the corruption of the leadership. And they interrupt him and say, how dare, like it's Jerry Springer at that point. I'm sorry to use such a crude example, but that's what you should have. He's got his James and John up the front as the big burly security guys who are lock, knocking down the ladies that are throwing their high heels onto the stage. He's preaching. Everyone is listening. But these, these arrogant Pharisees, priests and Levites come up and try and challenge him. And he absolutely puts them down, but then he doesn't stop there. He continues to pull them apart with what we see in chapter 12, Mark 12, 1 through verse 12, as a parable of the tenants. But just before we get there, go to Malachi chapter 3, the last book of the Old Testament. He was the final prophet who spoke to God's people before 400 years of silence when John the Baptist then broke onto the scene. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, we read the prophecy about this very week that we are in. So verse 1 says, Malachi's prophecy is, Behold, I send my messenger, that's John the Baptist, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek, that's Jesus, will suddenly come to his temple. That's the week that we're in, that he's coming and going every day in the temple, picking a fight with the leadership. (coughs) He says, And the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But, verse 2 says, Who can endure the day of his coming? It's like asking, who can stand at the mouth of, 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 a, of a ginormous lake or waterfall, who can just waltz up to that and stand under its full weight? The answer is no one. No one can just take a sip from Niagara Falls. It crushes you. It cleans you away. It leaves nothing in its path. And that's what the ministry of Jesus will be. He, he's sort of just been talking a lot to the crowds out in the country, but now he's brought it to their their house, he's in the temple, and none of them could stand in his presence. They were getting wiped out by his rebukes. Who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. So he's cleansing the gold and he's bleaching the linen white. That's what it means. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. In other words, Jesus is going to come to the self-professed leaders and the sons of Levi, that's the Levites, that's the clan, one of the 12 clans 
of um, sorry, the 12 tribes of Israel who, was, who were apportioned and allotted to do the teaching, the worship leading, the temple care, the sacrifices. That's the Levites. And it says that Jesus is going to come to the temple where they work, turn up the heat so much that their impurities are burned away and their sins are exposed. Is that what is happening in this week of Jesus teaching in the temple or what? But it goes on. <clears throat> in fact, if we go back just to the last verse of chapter 2, we see the context of what Malachi is saying here. The, the context, the social, spiritual context is that the Levites and the priests are corrupt and they're saying, God bless the evildoer. May God bless the unrighteous one and God's not going to do anything about it. It doesn't matter that God has these laws. Where is he? He's nowhere. He will do nothing. So verse 17 says, you have wearied the Lord with your words. And they say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who is evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or, when you ask, where is the God of justice? Then the answer comes. He will come suddenly to his temple, this one that you're asking about, and he will burn you away. Jesus came to that temple. Jesus came in a day much like Malachi's when the priests, the Levites, the leaders were corrupt down to the root. They were, they were adulterers. They were liars. They were thieving the people. They were extortioning the, the poor people among them for a profit. Verse 5 says in chapter 3, Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be swift against the sorcerers, adulterers, those who swear falsely against the oppressors of those who do not pay their workers their wages. He's going to come and judge. Now, now, I just need to remind you, this is a hermeneutical interpretive tool for every time you read the Old Testament prophets, including John the Baptist and Jesus and the book of Revelation. The Old Testament prophet, prophets were messengers of the covenant. It was their job to come on behalf of God Come to the people of God and remind them of the agreement they made with God. And say, here you are in his blessing with his gifts, but do you remember the words of the covenant on the scrolls in the temple? Do you remember that he told you to live this way? That he commanded that you not do these things? And therefore the, the ministry of the prophets can be broken down to be twofold. They came to promise judgment against covenant breakers, and blessings for covenant keepers who repent at the words of the prophet. That's what prophets came to do. Judgment is coming because you're disobeying the covenant. Blessing will come for anybody that returns to the covenant. That's what every prophet does in every book of the Old Testament. That's what Malachi is saying. Look at chapter 4 of Malachi. Speaking of the great day of the Lord when Jesus was coming to the world for both judgment and salvation. Verse 1 and 2 say... For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all of the arrogant and all evildoers will be kindling. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. That's what Jesus is coming to do. At verse 2, he's spoken of judgment, now he will speak of salvation. Verse 2, but for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. So that's the, that's the foretelling prophecy in the old covenant days. The final prophet of the old covenant, covenant was looking forward. A messenger will come, prepare the way for the Messiah, and then he will take it to the Levites and prove them to be corrupt. That is what is happening right now in Mark chapter 12. The same message that Malachi was giving is what Jesus is giving through this parable. Corruption in the leadership. The Lord comes to the temple. They are not ready. They do not have the fruit that is demanded of them. And he promises them judgment and salvation to any who repent and believe in him. Let's read it in Mark chapter 12, verse 1 through to verse 12. Please follow along in your Bible if you have one. The word of God speaks like this. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and he put a fence around it 
And he dug a pit for the wine press and he built a tower. And then he leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent to them another servant and, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and, and him they killed, and so with many others. Some they killed, some they beat. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and then the inheritance will be ours. And they took him. And they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of that vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read the scripture that says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, the foundation stone. This was the Lord's doing. It was marvelous in our eyes. And being quite a smart crew, they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. May God bless the reading of his own powerful word in our midst this morning. Amen. They perceived that he had told the parable against them. So yeah, they were listening. That would have been hard to miss. <coughs> We're going to look over this, really the, what the parable is, is a retelling of the story of Israel, and then we'll just finish with some very clear applications for us. It's, it's very obvious, if you go back to verse 1, that this rich man who is making an investment in a vineyard, and you have to be rich to own a vineyard, the joke goes that how you make a small fortune in the wine industry is that you start with a large fortune and make investments and lose most of it. That's how you make a small fortune in wine. It's, it's very expensive. You wouldn't make any fruit for a good five years. And so this guy's making a long-term investment. He sets the field. He puts up the fence. He sets the vineyard where you would watch for, for um, uh, the tower, where you would watch for robbers and whatnot. He did everything that this place needed to thrive. And he, then he, he entered into a contract with people. And, in, and that would be the tenants who would work the field, they would make it fruitful, and there would have been a pre-agreed upon contract that would say, we'll work, we'll make this much per month, you can go away, and in due time, you can send people, and we'll send back to you great amounts of profitable either money or wine. That, that's how it would work. There was an agreement. So, this, this landowner is, of course, pictured as God, and the people in the vineyard are the Jews, the people who have been given so much grace right, right back from the beginning. In fact, this, is, this parable is a very accurate retelling of the story of Abraham and his descendants because God didn't pick a nation and then give them blessings. He picked one dude who couldn't even have kids and said, I'm going to make you a family. And then to that family that doesn't exist yet, except for in my mind of election, them I'll give blessings to. So then he organized that they would be thrown into slavery so that he could show them how powerful he is in removing them and how futile false gods are. Abraham's descendants eventually go into the promised land and then before them, God just wipes out all of the other nations through very easily won battles and miraculous redemption. So he, he destroys these other nations in the land and then the Jews get to walk into this land with towers, buildings, banks, Movie theaters, water parks, that's, that's a little bit of exaggeration, but you get the idea. They walk into these cities that are already built. They don't have to build a single brick. They don't have to do anything. The houses are there. The banks are there. The towers are there. The, the military stations are all there. They just walk right in, and then in a couple of days' time, they go and harvest the whole farms that have been built by the previous tenants. It's an amazing blessing. No nation on earth has ever been blessed by God in this way. They were his chosen people. They were like the, these, these tenants who were welcomed into the, this vineyard that God had made and given everything they needed to thrive. The greatest blessing they ever got 
was the oracles of God in his laws and his promises. Those written down scriptures from God were the greatest blessing that they ever had. And like the tenants, they had an agreed upon covenant that was made in goodwill. Do you remember when God brought them up out of Egypt? brought them to Mount Sinai, and then he read over them the commandments and the conditions of the covenant, and he said, would you like to enter into this covenant so that if you obey, you will be filled with blessings, but if you disobey, you or your children, or your children's children, if that happens, you will be cursed. This is not a one-way street. To the left or to the right is destruction. Do you want my blessings? And they unanimously said, yes, we will do it. Remember Joshua, when he repeated the covenant, after that generation died, one generation, they're already done. They're already already gone back on their promises. Nonetheless, the next generation, Joshua says to them, choose for this day whom you will serve. We're going into the land, last checkpoint. If you don't want to come in, if you don't want to risk the curses, do not enter but me and my household will serve the Lord. And they all came in and entered in goodwill on that agreement. And so when the the landowner sends these messengers, these are symbols of the prophets. These are symbols of people who, who knew the agreed upon covenant and were chosen by God to go to the people and say, hey, what happened to the agreement that we made? Where's the income? The season's here, I find no fruit. Do you remember the the, the miracle a couple of sermons ago in Mark when Jesus cursed the fig tree because it didn't give him fruit when he expected fruit? So it is with Israel. God would send a prophet, go and tell them, remind them of the laws and, and the commandments, what they agreed upon. And what did they do with the prophet? They took him, they beat him. Isaiah, they, they saw in quarters and sent his body out over the town. Uh, other people, they, they, they tied up, they put in prisons, they mocked and they, 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 they jeered at them. Others, they killed, they were burned alive, they were slaughtered. This was the story of the prophets, just like the messengers that God sent to the field. We see the same thing, the same story told in Second Chronicles. I'll give you a moment to go there. Second Chronicles chapter 36. It's the last chapter of Second Chronicles, just before Ezra and Nehemiah. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 36, this is the, the story of the kings and the nation's uh, history in Israel. And at the very last chapter, in the second installment of this history book, Second Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 15, it gives us a very, a very grim telling of the story. Verse 15 of chapter 36, Second Chronicles says this, The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, until there was no remedy. Therefore, he brought up against them in punishment the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on the young man or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into the king of the Chaldeans." And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the temple, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burned the house of God, and broke down the wall of Jerusalem, and burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious vessels. August 27, 586 BC, the temple was burned down. August 27, remember that day. They rejected the God who sent them the messengers and they received their due penalty, which was destruction of the temple and exile so that they could not live in their promised city. The the very same story is told in another parable in Isaiah chapter 5. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. 
My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it out and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. Sound like Jesus' parable, right? End of verse 2. And he looked for it to yield, wi- yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes, bitter, sour grapes that are no good for wine. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not already done in it? And when I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste and shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. But he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. This is a frequently told parable and story in Israel. This is an age-old story. 1,500 years they've been in this land, and it has been a cycle of faithlessness and prophets come. A few will listen, called the remnant chosen for salvation. They are blessed, the rest are cursed. They will be faithless, prophets will come. They will be butchered and murdered and, and mocked and jeered. Some will believe and the rest will perish until eventually, eventually it gets to such a pitch that God says this sickness is throughout, and that's when the exile happens. God sent in enemies to go in, destroy, and burn down the temple on August 27th of that year. God's judgment is his patience eventually running out. We live in a day when you've been promised, no doubt, by pastors and preachers that will tell you, I promise God, God's love is infinite. God's patience is is infinite and unending and he's not angry with you. Those aren't preachers of the word. The Bible tells us that his patience is genuine. His call is, is genuine. You must come and believe he loves you, but if you reject... If you, if you refuse, and it's worse if you claim to be one of his and give him a bad name, his patience eventually ran, runs out. It ran out with the Jews, and they were burned that day when his judgment was poured out. See, in the, in the parable of the tenants, they were, they were quite, uh, they, they, they were, they thought themselves pretty smart, because at least they did the maths right. This guy owns the inheritance. The old man is not going to come and live in a vineyard. He's, he's far too old. That's why he got us to do it. He's got one son. He's the guy inheriting this place. Kill him. We get everything. Like, he's the one who's making trouble for us. The fact that there's another guy on the will. If we kill the guy on the will, he won't do anything about it. So they kill him. And they don't realize. What didn't come into their thinking was that the father has an army. And... That father had promised to raise up his son and destroy them through his son. This is where every parable breaks down. No guy who gets butchered in a vineyard resurrects. But this messenger, this son of the father does resurrect. What they had failed to remember was that the father had an army and he would exact vengeance for what they did. The Jews in their day had forgotten that the father would give life back to the son and give him vengeance over his enemies. They, they just didn't listen to Jesus when he kept on telling them, you're going to kill me. I'll come back. I'll destroy you. Repent. No, they said. We'll try our luck. We'll kill you. No more prophets will come, and we'll be able to just keep on making a rich buck in this whole religious system of ours. They thought that they could wipe him out and make a profit off the land themselves. But look at verse 9. <clears throat> Verse 9 in chapter 12 of Mark. We're back in Mark now. He said in verse 4 through 6, uh, sorry, verse through uh, 4 through 5 about how the messengers went. They were killed. They were, they were, they were mocked. Verse 6, he said he still had another one, a beloved son. And finally he sent them him saying they will respect my son, or at least they should. 
To not do so would be to break the agreement to the superlative degree. But verse 9, in telling this parable and foretelling his own death, Jesus says, what will the owner of the vineyard do? Now, now I love in in Matthew's version, uh, pardon me, I forget whether it's Matthew or or, or Luke's, but, but in the other version, he asks the question and the people answer him. Like the, the Levites and the priests rise up and, and in their self-righteousness, go, you know, if that was me, I'd raise up an army. I'd bring them to that little vineyard and I would destroy them and, and gnash them and put them to a miserable end. In fact, the, the language is he would put those miserable wretches to a miserable end. And Jesus says, amen. We, we can agree on that at least. And then he says what he says in Mark, yes, verse nine, what will he do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Do you notice how that's different to Isaiah's parable? In Isaiah's parable, the prophecy is God will come and set fire to the whole vineyard. In Jesus' parable, he comes and collects up the tenants, puts fire to them, and remains the vineyard. He keeps the vineyard. He doesn't throw away his purposes for salvation for the world because the tenants were unfaithful. He destroys the unfaithful tenants. So as we start seeing that the prophets would come and they would do those. I'm actually, this is going to be a little bit interactive. I hope you're ready. I know we're reformed, but we'll, we'll be okay. The prophets would come and they'll have twofold uh, portions of their ministry. First would be come to give what to covenant breakers? Judgment. I heard fire. That's, that's pretty angry. That's also true. Yes, judgment to covenant breakers. And what was he bringing to covenant keepers who would repent? It's an S word, Salvation. He would come and he would bring judgment and salvation, cursing and blessing. And it all depended on whether or not you responded. So we, could, we start asking the question, because if you were a good little gospel uh, class child and you start reading the story, you go, oh, this is the good part. The father sends his son. But it's not good news, is it? The father sends his son to destroy He's sending his son, and this is the beginning of the downfall of the bad guy. This isn't quite your normal gospel presentation, and yet it's hidden in there. Verse 9, we see judgment and salvation. The judgment is that the leaders and all who side with them will be destroyed. Verse 9 says, what will he do? He will come and destroy the tenants. Where's the salvation? There's the judgment, but where's the salvation? The salvation is in the last half of verse 9 that he will give the vineyard to others. This is what ends up playing out historically. The judgment comes in terms of Jesus' judgment. It is that he goes up to heaven in his ascension and from there he rules the nations, we're told. And one of his first acts as divine king is sending the spirit to the people of God. That's the, that's the vineyard given to another people. The, the other people is no longer a nationally, politically, geographically uh, uh, contained group of people in Israel called the Jews. Rather, it's the remnant of the Jews called the, the true Israel in, in, in Paul's writings. The, the true, those who believe in Jesus will receive the Holy Spirit. They'll clear out of Jerusalem and go and add to the true Israel Gentiles and people from every nation. That'll be called the church, the Jews and Gentiles in one new man. That's the new people receiving the vineyard who will produce the fruits that God desires. But there's a judgment. And the judgment, the judgment is that God, the God-man Jesus reigning reigning on his throne, really what we might even call the, the second act that he does as divine king is that he sends the Roman legions against Jerusalem. They destroy the outlands of Israel, concentrate their forces. All of the Jews are are, are compressed into Jerusalem city behind their walls. And what does Isaiah say he's going to do? What does Malachi say he's going to do? What does Jesus say he's going to do? He's going to tear down the walls. The Romans destroyed the walls. They fought long and hard. They butchered the Jews. They finally set fire to the temple on August 27th. The exact year, the exact day as an anniversary from the time that the first temple was burned. Jesus sent judgment upon those evil, wicked 
tenants. Verse 9, he will come and destroy the tenants. Wasn't Jesus carrying the sword? He was in heaven, yet he sent his mediators, the Romans. He used the Romans just like he used the Babylonians in, the, in Isaiah's prophecy. And in the writing of Second Chronicles, he used a foreign army as his means to judge the covenant breakers. And he gave to that remnant of the Jews and the Gentiles beside them the vineyard to work and keep the fruit. <coughs> Matthew chapter 21 verse 43 is the, is the equivalent of this telling of the story. And Jesus says, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. Now the apostles will be those tenants and they will make sure that the people in their care are fed and taught. So is sending the son an act of salvation or judgment? Yes. Depends on whether or not you are a covenant keeper or a covenant breaker. And we can start pulling out of this all sorts of applications for ourselves in our day and age. Point number one, note how earnestly God demands fruit. Note how earnestly God demands fruit. And and this this is not works-based legalistic commands because he's not commanding anyone who is in Christ to do something he hasn't already completely empowered you to do. He's not asking you to well up some Holy Spirit to try and gain some omnipotent resurrection, holy power inside of your soul to kill sin and produce righteousness. He's not telling you that. He's saying, I did that. I dug the well. I planted the grapes. I've put you in the land of the regenerate heart. I put the law in your heart. I gave to you the very image of my son and planted into your soul. You're a new creature. Act like it. Follow my laws. Pursue my great commission. Seek after the lost and the damned that they might be added to this beautiful vineyard to the glory of the King Jesus. That's the command. He is not asking you to provide your own power. He is telling you to work out what he has already worked in you. If Israel was removed from their privileged position of divine blessing in the administration of God's grace, and it was taken from them because they failed to live up to their agreed upon obligations, how much more ought we to take God seriously When in the covenant that was ratified by the blood of his son, we agreed to bear fruit and glorify him. John chapter 15, verse 8, Jesus says, By this my father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. What fruit are we talking about? In the Christian life, what what fruit are we talking about? We're talking about, first of all, the fruit of repentance, holiness, Christ-likeness, Love for our church family. Forgiveness towards those who are doing wrong. We're looking at holiness and Christ-likeness as that internal, individual and, and community, but that, but that individual fruit towards God. Repentance, Christ-likeness and holiness. And then secondly, the fruit that we bear for God is the adding of souls to the church through soul winning and discipleship making. We ought to be those who, unlike the Levites, do not close the door in other people's faces because we don't like those who aren't like us, but who are swinging them wide like Christ, beckoning everybody to come in and taste of the sweet wine, the beautiful honey, the great bread provided from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation. That's on us. Personal holiness, zealous great commission engagement. That is the fruit that God demands. It's, I've, I've heard the, the conversion moment of, of Christians compared to the Copernican revolution. Some of you nerds know exactly what I'm talking about. You just nodded. I saw you. The Copernican revolution was that moment when, when the astronomer realized that, that the earth is not the center of the universe. It's not geocentric. This universe is not revolving around the earth. Now, our system is solar centric. We're going around it We find our place, our our, our right situation and status only ever in relation to the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what salvation is. 
This, this eye-opening recognition, this revelation that it's not about me. I must, I must serve him. But the, the imagery goes, some people in their salvation treat it more or less like their relationship with the planet or non-planet Neptune. They're happy to have Jesus, and he makes a great outer planet in your solar system that spins around you, of course. And Jesus is welcome to be a little planet up there, and it's so good that he is. And he gets an hour and a half on a Sunday morning, and, and deconversion, you know what that looks like? It just looks what it looks like back in grade nine for me when they discovered Neptune's no longer a planet. How much did your life change then? When you got told, Neptune's not a planet anymore, it's now a satellite. But did that change any way in which you treated your children, in which you planned for the future, or you thought about the universe? Absolutely not. But how much would your life change if the sun was plucked from existence? Everything would find itself in utter chaos and destruction. That's the question to you. What difference does Jesus actually make in your life? Not, I appreciate that he's a planet out there and he's provided a vineyard and I'm enjoying blessings and I'm glad I'm not a drunkard anymore or I'm glad a, a couple of things have changed, but what difference does he actually make? Has, has your relationship to spouse, children, workmates, friends, other Christians, the law of God, the word of God written, has any of those relationships radically changed? If not, Jesus is a planet, you're yet to undergo conversion. Jesus demands in this parable that all those who would claim to have received from God great blessings in salvation would bring about fruit in return to glorify him. If we say, I will get to a good church, I'll hear sound preaching, I'll, I'll read good books, I'll receive many blessings from God's hands, but I will pay no homage. I will not reshape my whole life to bear fruit for him. I, I will not sacrifice anything that really stands in the way of my obedience. I don't think Jesus demands that. I, I, I will reinterpret, in other words, I'll reinterpret the terms of my contract. I will tell the master as he sends his messengers, I'll, I'll tell him that I've reconsidered, I would rather the contract and covenant work in a different way. Friends, is your life marked by internal, holy, fruit-bearing, Christ-likeness for the Lord God and outward service in his mission, the very reason that he came to win, seek, and save the lost. And then secondly, we can, we can look at the, the marvelous grace of God. While God's demand for fruit is genuine and zealous and earnest, and we see in Jesus' own parable that to anyone that would desire to be fruitless, we need to hear, bear fruit or perish. And yet, how great and marvelous is the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10 and 11. Jesus says, have you not read this scripture? Quoting Psalm 118. That's, that's a psalm they sung about him riding on the donkey. Now he's taken up the other end of that psalm, the ones who reject him. Have you not read the stone that the builders rejected has become the foundation stone? You thought you were too smart. You rejected God's messenger. You threw the sun away, but that became the foundation. It was actually, if you just dusted it off, that was your salvation. And it is now the foundation of God's kingdom. Verse 11, this whole, this whole arrangement of confusion and, 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 uh, and uh, beating the, the scoffer and the wise man, this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So, so Jesus has changed the analogy now. Go from vineyard to building. You reject Jesus. They rejected the Messiah, thinking that they had gotten the last laugh on God. You never outsmart God. He just puts you in his story as one of the people that fall over, get laughed at by the heavenly beings, and, and go away to judgment. You never outsmart God. He is able to use everything in his story for his victory and his alone. That's how it will always work. So these people that had thought they'd outsmarted, they'd, they'd done something clever, Jesus says, you are murdering, but God is life-giving through this act. 
How marvelous the grace of God is woven even through this judgment scenario. The murder that they enacted of the only righteous God's man is the most unrighteous act in all history, and yet it became the center point of redemption. It became the beginning of God's work in salvation. The murder of the only son of the father, after so many prophets, was God's plan for the birth of new covenant sons and daughters. So was the father sending the son good news or bad news? The answer is yes. Did the evil tenants murder the son or did the father send the son for the sake of those tenants? The answer is yes. And so we have to say, this was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. When Jesus, the true son, came, he was treated worse than any other prophet. And everything that Jesus says about the messengers is true of him. Verse 3. They took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. That happened to Jesus. Verse 4. They struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. That happened to Jesus. Verse 5. Him they killed. That happened to Jesus. Verse 8. They took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. That happened to Jesus. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes because in his dying at the hands of men, God was punishing the murderers of Jesus. They were punishing, he was punishing the murderers in Jesus such that they could go free through repentance and faith. It is marvelous in our eyes. All the grace that is on offer here in what Jesus is putting forward to these covenant breakers. That for murderers, the righteous one would die. That for sinners, the perfect one would be taken and beaten. For adulterers and fornicators and drunkards, for the unblemished, For the blemished, the unblemished one would be treated shamefully. For liars and thieves and blasphemers and abusers, the holy one would be punished. And ultimately, it was not the tenants, not the Pharisees or the scribes or even the Romans who killed him, but the father himself. This is marvelous in our eyes. It is the Lord's doing. This is the marvel of all marvels, is the grace of God. So powerful is the blood of Jesus. Go back to the first century. So powerful is the blood of Jesus that would be shed in just a few days from this parable. So powerful would be his drawing, forgiving, and cleansing power that in just a few months of it happening, some of the very Levites that are in front of him that day would be worshipping him as Messiah God and resurrected Lord. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Through the word of the apostles, after persecution from many of the Pharisees, after persecution from the Sadducees, yet Acts chapter 6, verse 7 tells us this. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Even those he's now threatening with judgment would be drawn by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel. And so now I issue the same welcome, the same wide open doors and wide open arms of the Lord Jesus. We said before, you cannot outsmart God. He uses everything to his own victory. Let that become a comfort to you. If you're a sinner, Baked it as a Christian for a while or not. First day in church. If you are a sinner with sin piled as as high as Mount Everest and you can see no way that this life can be made anything like a saintly, fruit-bearing Christian life, let me promise you again, God can use everything for his own victory. Your past trauma, your past sin, your past abuses, your past adultery, your past idolatry, your past sin, whatever it be, God will take it and turn it into increased rejoicing in your salvation. Jesus died such that nothing can now keep you from his salvation. And to Christians, to Christians, I'm as as an Old Testament prophet coming to you today to remind you of the covenant you joined when you had faith in Christ, when you went into that water of baptism, every time you take communion is a reminder of the covenant that you entered into on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You must not turn away. You must not 
Walk away from his commandments. You must today recommit, renew your heart, be honest about your sin and bring it to him. He will not tolerate a people with hidden sin. Hypocrites will burn. The the unrepentant who call Christ by name but not in their heart will be punished. I compel you, come to the good, gracious Lord Jesus. Even those who nailed his wrist to the cross Even those who called for his crucifixion, saying may his blood be upon us, even those eventually were able to come to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and repentance. You have no reason not to come. The son has died and his inheritance is open to you. Let's pray. Father God, we are not, we are not the hero of this story. We we cannot read this and interpret any portion of this parable as if as it may be like the, the Pharisees had until the last moment that Jesus was telling it, thinking that, that we were the righteous messengers, that, that we were the good people being mistreated and, and nothing bad that has come upon us we deserved and, and God in his love and his grace should really just come down and vindicate us. God, we recognize we are the evil ones. In this drama of redemption, we killed the son. In this drama of the, of the vineyard, we wasted your grace. We took your blessings and utilized them for our own good, our own, our own blessings, our own, our own selfish means, our own pride, our own arrogance. That's, that's us, Lord. And how different it looks in every single one of us. There is not a single person here present that has anything to boast of when they look to the throne of God. But we have the blood of the Son. Lord, we can look to you and being empty-handed, filthy in our soul, yet we can own Jesus Christ as our own. We, we can say, he died, he died for me. He resurrected, he resurrected to give me life. He now reigns on the throne, he is my Lord, I am bent to him, cleanse me, Lord God, and make me fruitful. And immediately, Lord, your grace is sufficient. You save, you forgive, and you use us for your glory. Lord, I pray for every Christian right now who is who is having a sense of all of the parts of their life that are not yet given over to you, the the ways that we take, we receive, and we might even say thank you, but we waste it upon ourselves, and we, we sit still in what is supposed to be an active, engaged warfare for the king. Lord, I pray that you would extend your spirit to convict. We know that the, the hard word of Jesus tenderizes our heart, and if we preach it softly, Lord, it, it leaves our heart hard. So Lord, tenderize our souls. Make make our hearts tender so that we can respond not in arrogance and evil doing which will lead us to burning but but in repentant, humble faith that fears the name of the Lord and and bends our knee to his lordship. Lord God, please forgive, re-empower and send out this week. May this just be a new week and the beginning of of a new chapter in the life of backslidden, falling Christians. Lord, for your glory and that we might produce fruit that is befitting of your name. We pray all of these things. And everybody said in the name of Jesus, amen.